What is culture? Before you can world build any cultures, you have to know what it is. I think culture is one of those concepts that is a little bit hard to define because we all know what it is, but it's a big topic and it's pretty intangible too. I like to imagine culture as the shared practices, beliefs, and values that arise from a group of people in an environment. But when you're creating a culture from scratch, I think the difference between good world building and bad is if the culture adds to the immersion of an audience or detracts from the point of the story. I'm Amara Guri, by the way. I'm a professional game writer and narrative designer, and I build story worlds for games. I've had world building as a hobby since I was just an itsy bitsy person, and I've had my share of vibes only worlds all the way up to the hard world building with perfectly plausible geography and entire legal codes from scratch. Don't forget, by the way, to drink some water because I am a perpetually dehydrated person, so maybe you are too. Also, don't forget that culture is very central to people's identities, so if you get too spicy in the comments, I'm just gonna delete you. It's just that easy. Now, let's get back to world building. Now that we know what culture is, which is the shared practices, beliefs, and values of a group of people in an environment, let's talk about goals. I feel like a lot of these videos never stop to consider why you're doing all this world building in the first place, so I'm going to stop. Uh, earlier I cited immersion as a key goal for world building, but how do you actually achieve that? I think it depends on your actual medium. For example, are you world building just to build a world as a thought experiment, possibly to post on a blog? Well, then your immersion hinges on the quantity of detail that you can plausibly keep consistent with each other. The craft is the thought experiment of the world itself. I will believe this world exists if you can write me a textbook to prove that it does, or if you're an illustrator, if you can show me art to show, show me that this world really exists. Are you world building for a novel, movie, or TV show? Maybe a play or an elaborate spin-off fanfic? Or maybe some other linear narrative? While well, the genre will change, audience expectations for your work, with ranging from sci-fi, fantasy, and other speculative works, expecting you to do lots of world building, where while contemporary romance might just need a little bit to explain the characters' backgrounds, you ultimately need enough world building for your audience to understand what is happening in a story and why. Like how Brandon Sanderson's magic systems let you understand why characters are making certain choices in a fight, because his hard magic systems set the rules. You can do more cool extra stuff in these linear stories, and but if you ask your audience to learn all of this stuff and you don't pay it off, that's not going to increase their immersion. That might just confuse them. I'm going to go after a story here no one will defend. Who am I? Les Mes by Victor Hugo. I read all 600 something thousand, 600... Uh, 50,000 words in uh, in that, and uh, let me tell you, one of these chapters that sticks out in my mind is, it begins, Jean Valjean headed down into the sewers, and then it proceeds to describe the entire history of the Parisian sewer system, and you might think with a whole chapter dedicated to it that this is important, but it's not, it's not. It, because he just, then the chapter ends with, and then Jean Valjean left the sewer. Bro, you did not just make me read a whole diggity dang chapter about the history of the sewer system just to not even have a scene set in the sewer system. And yes, I know it's because Victor Hugo released his novel serially and was paid by the word, but and it was probably an un uninspired week. I get it. He has to eat. But the story would have been better without that interlude. Anyway, that's what you sound like when you info dump about irrelevant things in your linear narrative. The most important thing in a linear narrative is that the audience has enough information to understand what is happening and why it is happening. You can add a little crunch for some story types. Uh, for example, maybe he could have given a paragraph about the sewers to justify why they're big enough to walk through, or explaining why they're scary, or to explain where they lead outside of the city. But otherwise, I think you should stick to the story and the characters. And lastly, the other type of thing that you might build for is, that I will address in this video anyway, is nonlinear, systemic, or interactive narratives. If in a linear narrative you want a world build so that your characters have levers to pull to make the plot go forward, in a nonlinear narrative, your world building should be the levers that your players can pull to make the world change. For example, in an Eberron Dungeons and Dragons campaign, knowing that House Deneath is the military house, while House Lorandar are the airship people, means you know where to go for militias or airships, should you need them. And those are different levers. 
In Baldur's Gate 3, understanding that vampires are just evil on the grand cosmic scale of the world by virtue of their brain chemistry, no ifs, ands, or buts. This means if you ascend Asterion from spawned full vampire like a crazy person, he's just going to perpetuate the cycle of abuse. In Rimworld, understanding that April May is a 15-day spring in the north and a 15-day autumn in the south means that you know what crops to grow so that your colony doesn't starve. Or you don't, and then they starve, and then that's a story too. In the Meow Wolf Interactive Art Exhibit, knowing that the museum is the alleged family home that fell to ruin uh, because of the hubris of the scientists there, it contextualizes all the secret journals and changes your view of what happened there. So as you can tell, every medium has its own way of immersing its audience. One of the reasons I bring all this up front is because art is so subjective. It's really easy for beginners to get lost and overwhelmed with all the options. How do you know if one choice is better than another? You don't, but mm, if you know, or rather should I say, you don't, if you don't have a strong gut feeling about it, then it's helpful to have that final goal as an objective North Star. And if you have some other goal behind your world building aside from immersion, that's totally valid too. It's just something to keep in mind as we start making decisions. You might want to also come up with some other North Star for your world building too, whether aesthetically or technically or whatever, like maybe you want your world building to be inspired by gothic steeples and Afrofuturism. Or maybe it's a concept like what if we built a train system like the one in Tokyo, but it runs entirely on steam. Or maybe it's even something like, I have a map and I want to put a culture at this location. What culture would appear there? My North Star today is going to be, what if the Vikings were Chinese? As some of you may know, I've been working on the updates to my Sagan culture uh, to have more elements of my birth culture, because I just legit don't know enough about China. So this is a great way to learn. And also, and then I just want to like mind palace it into my world building. For me, looking at the world building around my Sagan folk, it felt like they didn't have the polish and cultural fusional elements that some of my other cultures have. For example, the Novothulians have their Franco-Irish aesthetic with Japanese and Saka elements, and they have a mafia-like government structure. The Svanic people are Indo-Russian Mongolian. Those have a lot of disparate elements coming together to make it make a unique culture with its own unique flair. But the Saiyan folk were basically just Vikings. The Saiyan were actually part of a whole world building project um, from another ice world with an upper and lower continent and stuff, and that's the one that I'd written the, uh, the Codex of Laws for. Um, at first I tried to just redesign their fashion, thinking that would solve my problem, but I mean, like, look at this barely redesigned fashion here. The main difference is that they have more of a Hanfu style undershirt, but that wasn't actually my problem with the culture, so it didn't solve my problem. So that's what gave me the idea, what if my Vikings were more Chinese? Uh, and so that's going to be my tent poles for the redesign of the Sagan culture. You'll have to go through it with me as we go through this video. Now that we have our goals, our world building pillars, if you will, our next step are to figure out what the values, practices, and beliefs are of our culture. Now while creativity isn't linear, time is, so I have to explain them to you in an order. But don't feel like you have to follow these steps exactly. Values. Values are the things that people hold to be important. A culture's values answer the question, why do we prioritize certain things? Some examples of values might be individuals versus the community, freedom versus security, retribution versus forgiveness, experimental rebellion versus rigid tradition, the present or the future. If your goal with picking values is realism, like if you're world building for the thought experiments, then you're going to want to make s stick to values that make logical sense to human beings. For example, if you have a culture that thinks you should just always kill everyone else, that's kind of unhinged in a way that doesn't feel realistic. Uh, and so you have to have a really good reason why you got there. But two, it's not going to exist very long because all those people will kill each other, right? Because they all value killing people. Like, you have to have rules to keep people in check for that sort of thing. Oh my gosh, so this is my biggest problem with Fourth Wing, actually, by Rebecca Yaros. The murder rules don't make any sense. Like, you can murder whoever in the school, then not while they're sleeping, and also not during duels. But you also can't be a liability to the unit. But, bro, isn't murdering your teammates making you a liability to your unit? Like, the rules don't make any sense if you think about them for more than two seconds. Also, sidebar, why are we putting all the rebellion noble kids in the Dragon Riders when the Dragon Riders are the officers of the army? Like, if you're conscripting them as a punishment, why would you make them in charge of the army? Like, just 
make it make sense. All right, sorry. I had such high hopes for this book. I was so disappointed. Uh, anyway. Oh, unrelatedly, uh, a thing that's really cool about cultural values is that a majority of a culture will typically express one value. Uh, for example, we in the USA love the Christian God, um, and there will be subcultures or countercultures who believe the opposite, like the Christ like the USA's growing number of atheists and agnostics popping up all over the country, and not to mention every other religion, of course. Uh, and before you try to tell me that the USA has freedom of religion, separation of church and state and stuff, like the pledge, the Christian God's in our Pledge of Allegiance. He's a pretty big deal here. And don't explain it into the comments for me. I know it's because of communism in the 1950s. It's not the conversation we're having. Um, incidentally, I find values, though, to be the least connected to the rest of the elements because there's not a coherent link between environment and values, usually. Like, there have been individualists in deserts and communal co societies in deserts and everything in between. So actually, when I pick values for culture, I pick them in opposition to another culture to create contrast and dynamism in my work. For example, in my Sagan revamp, I wanted to keep their focus on family units because that makes them a thematic foil to Novothul that cares about an individual more than a family. But I also wanted the hyper-individualism that pervades all northern cultures. And that way, they're a sharp contrast to the communism in the south. In my upcoming Untitled Isaya game, with its linear story, this is going to allow the audience to passively absorb uh, the thematic elements through everyday character interactions, because the contrast will trickle down into the characters just being themselves. But in an Isaya tabletop role-playing game, it gives players an easier way to differentiate the cultures, which will get them into role-playing faster. And it also gives them an easy lever to use in Sagan cultures, like if you want a Sagan character's help, you just like offer to help them or threaten their family or whatever because you know that's a core value of the culture. Practices. Practices encompass all of the physical parts of a culture we can see. It's probably the thing you think about when you're thinking about world building cultures, like what is their food, what are their dances and music, holidays, fashion, architecture, vehicles, cooking utensils, weapons, how do they wage war and diplomacy, what is their language and writing like, what is their currency and economy like? What items are common to own? What habits and mannerisms are considered to be polite or strange? Honestly, if I were you, I would find yourself some kind of template for this part. Uh, I use this modified Ryutama template to world build all my cultures these days, and then I toss in reference photos and art, and that's enough to get me started. I'll let the details come to me later. Um, but maybe if you're a beginner and you want more guidance, um, I, you can check out the link I have in the description of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writer Association's world building questionnaire. Uh, and you can dig deeper into the specifics for your world. I'm certain you're capable of reading them, so I won't read them for you. But here's some things to note. If your world building is a thought experiment, I, or at least if I were, I do a ton of research and then just try to cover literally everything, starting from what is the general geography of the world to small things like do we have windows and do we latch them closed? If I was doing this for a linear narrative, I would focus on the world building around the characters. Like if I have an assassin, I world build mm, how they get clients. If I have a dancer, I world build the dancing. If I have a boat story, I world build the distances and seafaring practices. However, if I'm in a collaborative project with a strong uh, visual component, it may also be good to design an art bible and style guide-like thing for how you want your world to look. But also, if you're doing something collaborative, uh, remember that your collaborators are people with thoughts and feelings and uh, creative decision-making capacity. Um, so you've got to give them a little breathing room. Um, that being said, working with other people is definitely a whole topic for another video, uh, probably on somebody else's YouTube channel, because I am not a collaborator expert. Um, and lastly, if I was doing some of this for something interactive, I would make some dice tables to answer random questions for players, or do enough world building to create convincing illustrations or models for the world, but mostly I was going to focus on the world building of the things the players will actually interact with. So if it's a politics game, that's the factions and what they do, and their motives and resources. In a fighting game, you focus on abilities and their limits. In an economic sim, you focus on supply chains and market trends. Now you might be wondering, where do cultural practices even come from in reality? I think in general, cultural practices originate as a reaction to the environment. Like, for example, silkworm silk became an expensive commodity that symbolized wealth because it took a long time to make and required a lot of skill to craft, but it's also very comfy and pretty, so the demand was super high. Um, the first person to make silk were in modern-day China, uh, because that's where the worm actually lives, but 
so like the cultural significance of silk rose from the literal facts about silk. It's only one spot and it takes a lot of effort to make. But obviously other, mm, other practices come from belief. For example, Jewish people don't eat sell shellfish because God said no shellfish. Um, and in addition to being, or sorry, but in addition to being spiritually unclean, shellfish was much riskier to eat historically before refrigeration and like chemical stuff. And so maybe God said no shellfish because it was literally making Jewish people sick. Now, that's pure speculation, of course. I don't assume to know the workings of a Jewish God, but like that's a potential scientific explanation for a spiritual phenomenon. On the other side, people who live in cold northern the cold northernmost regions of our world don't cover their whole bodies in thick warm clothes because they believe they should. Whether the people living up there buy into modesty culture or not is basically irrelevant because it is so cold they have to cover up. I bring it up all the time, but you know the Saka people in Yakusha? They're, they're like, capital city is on permanent permafrost. They are always going to wear clothes, man. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what their opinion is on not wearing clothes. However, what begins as a reaction to our environment, such as wearing fur in cold climates, could always turn into a practice that demonstrates beliefs or values, such as wearing fur clothes to show off your wealth, or refusing to wear fur because of animal cruelty or something. So, for the Sagan people, I personally started my revamp by reevaluating their place in my environment. I looked at their, like, look at their home, hometown on the map here. You see how far north that is, and also how it's under the upper continent? That means it is cold and dark. The only sun they get is in the mornings and maybe the evenings with that sliver in the selfie territory that also gets some sun. So fashion-wise, I had the right idea with furs and multiple layers. Food-wise, they're probably going to be pretty reliant on the ocean and that bread basket area that's around where they presumably started, since Novathul took that river valley there. Um, but, uh, but back then in my head, Sagenheim was just a normal city with like brownish palisades around it. But then I had an idea. What if it had underground agriculture? Underground agriculture was some kind of fungi that thrived in permafrost. And maybe there's like a whole ecosystem that's built on the fungi, and you have semi-aquatic animals and insects and stuff. And now, see, like that already sounds more interesting than basic city un vaguely underground. Um, and uh, some other elements I pulled on were like, I started a story that was loosely based on Sagenheim for a class one time, and uh, in it, demons were being murdered because no one cares about demons, and so I felt like, mm, feel like that can work even better if you have like a very vertical city with that upper class, lower class, upper city, lower city divide, like in Arcane. Um, and you know who else has upper cities and lower under cities? Hoyoverse Games. Billabog and Fontaine were just coming out when I was doing this revamp, and I am obsessed with those games, so I love to take influence from them. And at the time, I had also just started on a uh, preemptive Fontaine fix-it fanfic called The Sunken City, though I love Fontaine, but it did not do the thing I was expecting it to do, and that that means I'm free to do the thing it was expecting me to do. Let's go. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I took a bunch of those elements for my rewrite. Plus, um, with how close things are to the north, and they, this the endless ice that is my north pole, um, I, mm, I was thinking that they could see it as a holy relic of the god of winter, a Sarali, and given that he's the father of humanity in their eyes, and also the source of their magic and sages, it makes sense to live nearby. Like, that's why they're still here and not moving to somewhere better. Um, uh, oh, and maybe the North Pole of Isaiah is just a giant east crystal, and they could call it a Sarali's throne. Um, so, like, after this brainstorming, I feel like it was pretty easy for me to see where the Chinese influence should go. My broad stroke's understanding of Chinese culture is that it's a lot about respecting your place in society, respecting authority, and the responsibilities of authority and submission and harmony. Obviously, it's more complicated than that, but, like, that just means it's time to go research more. Okay. You know, one of my favorite cultural practices to invent, I mean, yeah, we're still talking about this, is food, because it tells you so much about a culture. If you watch all my videos, you know I don't shut up about food, but I cannot emphasize how much, how important this is. Mm -hmm. um, like, for example, one of the reasons we think Eastern cultures tend to emphasize the collective while Western cultures emphasize individualism is because Eastern cultures tend to eat more rice, which is a grain that requires more collective labor, whereas wheat is more sustainable for a single far family to farm alone. That value 
ends up pushing through so many other cultural aspects, like a nomadic hunter. Oh, and、oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So nomadic hunter gatherer societies are also famously egalitarian because nobody has more wealth than, that much more wealth than anyone else because everyone's walking around and hunting all the time.、Um, that being said, a hyper individualist culture could have simply prevented farming from ever being viable. Or a hyper individualist culture could lead to really competitive farming controlled by evil authoritarian corporations. So I stand by what I said. Values are not tied to ecology, but they might be influenced by them. So just think about how your people are influenced by their environment. If you haven't, by the way, I highly encourage you to check out Nikari Spearday's video on staple foods. It is incredible, and it has all the collegiate references that I'm referencing here. But like. You know, like listed out rather than me just being like, "Yeah, that's definitely a thing I learned." <laughs> um, cultural practices, by the way, are also how you're going to get the aesthetics of your culture too, because function often dictates form. Design theory actually just made this great video about how some designs are so classic they can't be changed, like the QWERTY keyboard or the paperclip. Oh, and related to food. Uh, design theory also has an incredible theory about utensils that I use to design all the utensils in my world. So if you're interested in that, you should go check that out also. So for the my Sagan people's practices,、um, I knew I wanted to keep their sailing, conlang, and culture because I'm a big fan of what my music friends have done with their music around sailing and stuff.、Um, but as I did that research into Chinese culture, I realized like how much stuff I could actually use from that. I watched a bunch of videos from this video essayist named Aini. I'll also link her below, as well as、uh, crash course episodes on China, as well as a bunch of History Channel videos. And obviously, China is a really big country with thousands of years worth of history, so I'm not going to absorb it all in like six months.、Mm, but here are some of my big takeaways、um, about things that I think would be neat in a culture. Don't take this as like Chinese representation. It's more like. Here are cultural elements that I think would be interesting to explore my own way. There is both immense pressure in say in China. It sounds like to succeed, and your family will still help you because of the communal values. So you have this interesting contrast between hyper individualism and and communal values.、Um, they also I really love the way they have different. Types of masculinity historically, like non things that don't really align to like Western ideals of masculinity, and so I like the idea they're just being more distinct categories of gender in Sagan culture too, and maybe they defy the traditional Western、mm, ideals of、uh, man and woman. Tm. Um. Oh, also Chinese technology, so cool historically. I mean, obviously gunpowder, fireworks, but obviously like the way silk is made is so cool. Their wheel boats were giant, like way bigger than like a lot of the other world rest of the world was building at the time.、Uh, their dancing tech, like history, is so cool. The music and their astrology system. That I I just learned so much about all the things I don't know about and how many things I need to learn.、Um, So yeah, and just process-wise, at this point, I started.、Mm, I felt like I had enough research to like actually jump off. So I got together a mood board、mm, to put together some of my old ideas and some of my new ideas.、Mm, and、uh, I think that my revamp can be encapsulated in this sketch. First thing to notice is the Sagan folk have a color scheme that isn't just jewel tone red and gold, because the Sphonic people were red and gold, not jewel tone. And I had so I had to change it to get their vibes to be unique. I experimented with teal and green for the northern lights or northern light vibe, but green felt really weird. It made them too elfy, and teal is already Telethon's color, so I think it.、Mm, I think it would have been too similar.、Um, and then Nova Thule is purple slash navy blue and black, so、um, I can't make them blue. So instead of making them red. Or jewel, they're red more jewel toned. I took it towards cyberpunk neon, like Barbie pink. But now I need a justification for the pink. So I thought, what if it was magenta? Because you know, magenta doesn't actually exist on the color spectrum. It's our brain making up a color when we get red and blue at the same time. So with this in mind, a saralized color、mm, is magenta now. A saralized being the father of humanity and stuff. Mm, and God of Magic would have like a color that it makes sense for him to have a color that's like not doesn't really exist in our world normally. So now wearing bright pink is considered to be fatherly and magical and clever. 
Um, I'm keeping the black though because black plants work really good in the environment in underground settings. They absorb way more lights, light when they get it, um, or in my pseudo underground setting anyway. Um, so th if all the plants are black, that can be the color of their mother earth. So now they've got their earth mother and like ice father and that th those are the colors that they primarily wear in the culture. And they'll consider black to be homey and calming like green is to us. So basically, the Sagan aesthetic is pastel gothic Chinese Vikings, and I hope that you're very excited for that combination. I didn't ultimately end up changing the language to have more of a Chinese flair for it. I removed tense conjugation, I fixed up some of the harsher sounds that I just simply didn't like, and I added an X to it, spoke, and I imagine it now spoken with that Chinese-like cadence that, that comes from having tones, but sadly, I'm too much of a coward to add tones. I really tried, but I just can't hear the difference between tones, it's so embarrassing. I tried so hard, but I cannot, he I don't hear tone differences. I'm like, what is happening? So if I can't hear it, I can't replicate it. And if I can't replicate it, then I couldn't speak this language. So I gave it more of a Japanese pitch system instead. Or strictly speaking, it's not really tonal, but it's like baked. So like it's not baked into the language uh, where you're making your preschoolers chant to practice your tones, but they still have like unexpected pitch on things. It's like the emphasis on the wrong syllable or the emphasis on the wrong syllable thing. Like, yes, I know what that means, but it's a little funky if you say it weird. So that's sort of where I'm going with it. Next, we have the fashion. The fashion is very specifically stolen from the silhouette of Hanfu still, just with more fur and different materials. Um, I imagine it being rheumatoid wool, that's, uh, but also maybe leather and dyed animal skins, or maybe bamboo silk from their bamboo. I still want to keep their elaborate Viking-y braids uh, and wavy hair. I think I still want to keep their hand, their, they're using their hands to paint their faces, um, typically for sunscreening, snow glare, sea glare reduction reasons. But I think it'd be neat if they could use it also for receiving blessings from their gods. Um, I don't have any other cultures that do a lot of things with tattoos or face paint, so I think having that really be their thing is important. Uh, and lastly, I decided that they prefer gold medals to contrast with the fact that Thule just has a lot of silver medals. That's just a contrast thing. No real reason for it. All right, next, next, houses. They build houses out of silvery bamboo stalks that grow under the upper continent. I really like these tent-like silhouettes to their houses, and you've got all these little tents stacked on top of the other ones. But I think they also might have igloo like igloo-like bulb-shaped homes for temporary shelters or for shelters that are more out in the mountains. Um, and then their ships are going to be like like dragon-headed ships um, with wings mm, for sails and blade-armored fronts, mostly for the ice, but also for ramming each other. And uh, maybe even some of them ride small whale-like land sharks with sealskin saddles. Weapons and tool wise, they're going to be really known for their East Lanterns. Okay, well, everyone has their own East Lanterns, but like differently. Um, theirs, of course, are going to be really pretty pink. They will call the pure, purest form of East Light. It's not really going to be, but unlike some places that use East to make mm, in light patterns to make light, and other places that use East to make fire based lanterns, um, they are going to make their lanterns by just taking a lot of east and cramming it together in one location. And while typically east is invisible to the human eye, putting enough of it in one spot makes it visible. So that's what they do. The reason I think that's going gonna to be that teardrop shape, by the way, is because they're going to have a teardrop shaped bulb that's going to be this natural nutrient restoring fungi that grows on, um, underground there in Saganheim. Probably a god put them there though, because they, they're kind of like too good to be true. They're also going to have guns with magic bulbs that when struck will shoot up fire. Uh, so really they're flamethrowers, but I don't like the way that sounds as much, like phono aesthetically. And then last, and weapons wise, they'll also use these Tang Dynasty inspired swords and pole axes. Um, animal and creature wise, I think their rheumatoids are going to be much bigger and bulkier, and I'm going to have to come up with a Sagan word for that. Um, and they're going to be a little more cattle-like thanks to the flatter plains around Saganheim. Um, Novothul is going to keep their live leafy, leapy rheumatoids because they're in the mountains. And I think they'll also keep Arctic bunnies as like a food source, even though in Nova Thule, these will be considered to be pests. And then not shown in this sketch, I also think they rely heavily on butterflies of the heart for honey, wax, and mead, because despite their name, my butterflies of the heart are actually bees. They just evolved wings through convergent evolution. 
Now above the Sagan Ime Cave are these enclosed plains of black bamboo forests. Currently, un currently unnamed but critically important, fungus is going to grow in tandem with the bamboo there, and maybe in the winter it gives bamboo nutrients back, and eventually the fungus eats the dead stalks while fixing the soil for new growth. So that's sort of my thought, is that it's this like back and forth between these two species here. I think the ground fungus is usually dried and ground up and then used for soups or baked goods like flatbreads or meatloafs. Um, meanwhile, uh, but like, you know, mushroom version. And meanwhile, the tree fungus is usually eaten without the grinding, but still boiled, baked, and fried, or maybe it's dried and ground up to be brewed like coffee. And that's where Northerners are gonna get the coffee. The coffee's a lie, they're perpetually drinking American Civil War Confederate coffee substitute, but you know, at least their coffee's gonna have good protein micronutrients and like caffeine-like substances, unlike real Civil War coffee substitute, which is just sad, it's just... It's just brown water that you pray is coffee. <laughs> By the way, I've also changed Saganheim now to be nestled in this place called the womb of the world. It's gonna be this damp refuge in the otherwise hostile, very northern part of the tundra, warmed by the way that the east springs here interact with stones and such, warming the cave to livable temperatures year round. This makes sense because Saganheim is allegedly where humanity was born, so it doesn't make a lot of sense for humans to evolve in a place I mean, like, even vaguely similar to the way they've evolved in our world, in a place that's super inhospitable. So it makes more sense that they maybe evolved to live in this, like, micro-environment of this cave, and then got smart and spread out because gods helped them. Now, like with all this, this kind of sounds vaguely like the Sagan people are cooperative, extended family-oriented fo folks. But no. Due to the harshness of the environment, a great deal of emphasis is being placed on survivability and the military, and when everyone is seeking to be better, then you can't rest for a moment, or you're gonna fall behind. So if you're not young enough to be getting cleverer, stronger, better, more useful, then you have to be teaching people how to get there. Otherwise, you're just considered to be useless to society, and that's, like, that's the stigma. Um, now, every family has its own sort of weird military hazing ritual that involve ridiculously long, cruel, and unnecessary training hours. And um, now, that being said, I want this, like, I say military, but I mean, I want it to be an, like an educational hazing ritual. And it's going to be this really round, well-rounded education, but there'll still be really weirdly specific judgments about you, depending on what kind of instruments you play or what kind of weapons or poetry or cooking recipes you know. And even though your extended family will provide you food and teach you and find you private tutors as you grow up, you will be constantly compared to your siblings and cousins. Like, if you're worse than any of them, you're going to be pressured, like, why are you not, like, the best? And if you're better than everybody, then why aren't you better by 200% or 300%? Like, you can't be enough in Sagan culture. Which brings us to... Beliefs. But when I say beliefs, I really mean paradigms of knowledge, but that sounds posh. So to put it more casually, I mean the way we think about things. For example, I believe the Earth is a planet that revolves around the sun, which is a star, and this is what creates days. Now, yes, this is a series of facts discovered through scientific observation. But I also haven't personally done all that observation myself, so how do I know? In fact, how do we know anything? Um, quite frankly, at some point, mm, it's hard to try to verify that everything's real, so it's just more convenient to assume that uh, something is real and, and, and that it, we just move on. So how does your culture organize its knowledge? Based on its values and practices, how do they tell stories? What do they tell them about? What story do they tell to conceptualize themselves? How do they conceptualize time? How do they conceptualize individuals as bodies or minds or souls or as a face of the universe or as a divine creation or as a dust? How does your culture imagine things around them from the sky to the ground to their homes to the laws of physics to the laws of gods? How do they believe you lead a successful life, a normal life, a happy life, a bad life? Something fun that you get to know as this culture's creators what is your culture wrong about? What have they simplified to the point of basically being wrong? What are they almost right about? And how is objective reality going to interact with the subject subjective reality of this culture? When picking what beliefs to prioritize, consider your medium again, uh, as with the other categories. What possibilities do you want your world most to ex explore? What beliefs will limit your people to exploring the most interesting aspects of your world? Um, and thematically, what is your story or game about? Since Sagan beliefs are kind of self-evident from my description, I want to give a different example. Something I know I believe 
is that anyone can be a creative, and creative people should make what they want to express themselves, even if it isn't popular. I mean, that's basically what this YouTube channel is for, right? Like, all my best videos are ones that, like, a hundred of you watch, realistically. And you know what? That's okay, because for me, the act of creation itself is the most important part. Is what I would say if I was emotionally stable, but I'm not. <laughs> I really do wish that mm, some of my actual world-building videos did as well as my tutorials. Um, I'm still working on myself emotionally to BH, but, like... Uh, you know, if you're watching this video, you're probably still working on being emotionally healthy yourself. And you know what? It's okay to be halfway through that process and for emotions and world building to be messy. Life isn't emotionally clean. And I think, in a way, it's kind of charming like that. But with that, I believe it's time to actually showcase the culture we have world built over the course of this video. Take it away, Sheezy. <laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome to Kirtan Hall. I am Xizi, first princelet of Kirtan Hall, and headmaster of the Bard Academia. I actually have 19 years, like Abradicina de Novo Zul, but today, Deng Sai Song, I am a child. Kirtan Dala, also known as the Hall of Power, the Magenta Hall, the foremost academy of bards, and the home to victorious ones, is the Sagan Hall most known for its historians. Because we win, so we always write the history. If you are accepted into Kirtan Hall and survive the zeroth semester, then you can study history, of course, but also languages, dance, music, instrument crafting, textiles, clothing, smithing, shipwriting, and combat. While I had the privilege of growing up around the Bard Academia itself, my father, the previous headmaster, showed me no particular favoritism growing up. I mean, it was only after he died in the annihilation at Aunan Chao that we looked at his will and it seemed he had wrote me into it, but it should have been Su Ani, my older sister, or even Xinri, my father's second. I still had to take the entrance exam and I nearly died in the entrance exam just like everyone else. Not to mention, in Su Ani's shadow, everyone always expected the headmastership would go to her. She was always beautiful and effortlessly talented at everything it felt like. She never needed to study, and honestly, if she applied herself, she would have been better than even Sinri, who's the top of her class. Ah, uh, but enough of my family matters. I'm showing you behind the curtain when you all want to see the veil. Shall I show you around Sagenheim then? Look, from this stack, you can see all of Sagenheim. Well, most of it anyway. That square is where Kirtan Dala holds its public God's Week ceremonies. Down there are the docks, and near them we call that district the Skyne. And there you can see the mushroom farms. That's the phrase. And the spindly spire up there? That is Sagan Dala the Sage Hall. In ancient times, they imprisoned sages there. Well, depending on the period, you see. See my tattoos? They mean I am a sage. My parents took me to touch the endless ice when I was a toddler, and I came back as a sage, a sega. But some people don't get magic, and others don't survive touching the endless eyes ice at all. This is because it is up to Asarali, the father of humanity, god of secrets and winter, to decide what happens to those who touch his throne. But it is illegal to be a sage without a tattoos. We look the same as anyone else without them, and that is dangerous. Novothul, 
is where sadistic, unmarked sages go. If you are a sage and you do not have marks, you must run away to there, or you will be hunted down by the witch hunters. Oh, what's in that hole? That goes down to the salvages, the underground part of the city, home to the Hollis Hall, where lowlifes who don't have what it takes to contribute to society hide. We don't really pay attention to what happens down there. Oh, my hat? It is modeled on a bear cat, the Baoni. They are some of the most dangerous and yet benevolent creatures of the North. While known for caring for small children who get lost in storms, there are also terrifying stories of them conjuring blizzards should anyone even look at their cubs. This is because they are Dameya, the Earth Mother's other children. As such, in the springtime, to ensure peace between humanity and our Baoni siblings, we all dress our children in Baoni outfits so the bear cats will not ferry them away. And of course, dancers like me train to look intimidating so they know we can protect our children. I have never had a bear cat come to one of my dances, but you never know. You want to see one of my performances? Ha! <laughs> I don't do that for free, you know. Free performances only come from dirty Telethenian commies. If you want me to perform, you'll have to like, comment, and subscribe!